So today we're going to focus on modeling of electrical systems. We did the mechanical systems in the last lecture. Today we're going to do electrical systems. And later on, we'll see that the equations that describe a mechanical and an electrical system are pretty much the same. They just represent different elements in the system, but the structure of these differential equations are precisely the same. Meaning that for every electrical system, there exists a equivalent mechanical system and vice versa. And they are governed by the exact same set of differential equations. Another uh, application of what we're going to see here is, of course, to develop electromechanical systems that will have elements from mechanical and electrical systems, uh, combine them to develop something more sophisticated than just mechanical or electrical. But before we jump into that, let's go back to lecture three, just a very quick review of what we did there. So this is that accelerometer that we talked about in the last lecture. We have here a casing with two masses inside. These masses are translating inside of that casing. They're attached to the springs, as you see, and there are uh, there is friction between these masses and the casing. So friction occurs at any point of contact there. So the way this works is that if, is if you accelerate the casing, the masses will be subjected to a force and they move. By then measuring how much they move, we can quantify the acceleration of the casing. So this is a more advanced model of the accelerometer than we saw in the last lecture. Let's look at this. I'll, I'll let you read all these um, stuff here later. It's just explaining how it works. But the important thing to note here is that the casing is given a position, a displacement X3 and the displacement of each mass inside of the casing is given a displacement x1 and x2. Now, how do we go about getting the equations of motion for this system? There is a lot going on here. There is spring connected between the masses. There is friction here, friction there, and so on. So think about it. How would you start this problem? How would you start creating the, the equations of motion? We need, of course, the free body diagram for this. But it's not uh, very simple because we, well, we know which forces are acting on each mass, but the direction of these forces can get a bit tricky. So here is an equivalent representation of this system. And let's see if that makes more sense. You have this in the next slide, but I, I just put it here. So you have two pictures in the same one. So this system can, exact, can be represented by this arrangement. Now look at, the, uh, at them and see if you can understand what is going on. See if this makes sense. If you can see that these are exactly the same ones. The casing has been replaced by this rectangle right here. And the displacement is applied to that rectangle. Now, when we make the casing move to the right, you see that the casing will make masses M1 and M2 also move to the right. Now, with respect to a fixed point outside of the casing. So what we can say is that all these elements inside the, these boxes, inside the casing, will make the boxes move or the masses move to the right by applying a force that will make uh, in that direction. So for example, if we just break the case here and there, it's uh, obvious that uh, as we move the case, the case into the right, that is spring will make mass M2 move to the right as well. The tricky part is to see what is happening with friction. And you, re you remember the example we saw last in the last lecture where you had the analogy I made with a piece of paper and a marker on it. If the paper moves to the right, so does the marker. And that's because of friction between them. So we could say that there, the friction can be modeled by these dampers connected to each mass and the casing. And as the, the casing moves to the right, it will apply forces to the casing, to, to each boxes, each masses that is also going in, in, to the right in the same direction. Why we have 2B here instead of B? Well, because each one accounts for friction along two surfaces. So that's number two there. So these two representations are precisely the same. There is no difference between them. Now, once we have this representation, it is a lot easier to find the free body diagram. And you can, let's just start with mass M2. If we hold mass M1 in place and apply the input displacement X3, 
we can see that at both the spring and the damper connected to these mass, we will apply a force to the right, and here they are. The spring displacement depends on X3 minus X2, that's the relative compression of the spring, and the damper will depend on the speed X3 and the speed of X2, so that is X3 dot minus X2 dot times the coefficient of viscous friction. If we are again holding mass M1 in place and mass M2 is moving to the right, is that this second spring connected between them will now oppose motion and apply a force that goes in the opposite direction. Now notice that the relative displacement of both ends of that spring depends on the mass itself X2 and uh, displacement of mass X2 and X1. And why did we write X2 minus X1 rather than X1 minus X2 or even X3? minus x2 rather than x2 minus x3. Well, if we move mass m3 first by inputting the displacement there, we could say that a mass m3 needs to move first before the other masses can move, which is not totally accurate, but we could say that x3 is greater than x1, which is greater than x, uh, x2, which is greater than x1. So in order to get a positive value inside uh, for each magnitude of forces, we have to assume x3 minus x2 and x2 minus x1. Now let's look at the last one here. Last one uh, has, has a mass and has two forces acting on it. As mass M2 and the casing are moving to the right, they will apply forces that will make the mass M1 also move to the right. And here are their magnitudes. The first one is the spring. And look that uh, notice that the spring Compression depends on the both, both sides of the spring here, X2 minus X1. And the viscous friction force depends now on the speed of each side of the damper, which in this case is X1 and X3 dot. Not that multiplies by the coefficient of viscous friction gives the magnitude of that force. What do we do next? Well, now we can simply sum all forces acting on it. Uh, we did that in the last lecture. I'm not going to repeat here, but it's just the, the, the formulation. Sum of all forces equals to M1 or M2. Let's do M2, X2, double dot. And to establish this, we can assume that forces creating motion in the direction of acceleration are positive and forces going in the opposite direction are negative. Okay. So it's just to say that when you look at this problem here, it looks quite intimidating, but by realizing that it can be represented like that and creating the free body diagram, that simplifies the problem significantly, right? So don't underestimate the importance of these initial steps rather than just looking at the, the problem and then going right away with equations. Take the time to write an equivalent model if needed to write the free body diagram properly and then do the equations of motion. Are there any questions regarding this particular problem? Uh, yes. Um, could you explain how the force K is affecting M1 and M2 again? Yes. So let's assume, let's look at M2. If mass M1 is uh, is held at a fixed point like that. And the mass in the casing is moved to the right. The case will compress this spring and the motion of mass M2 will also compress that spring. Right? As mass M2 moves to the right because the casing is moving to the right, both springs get compressed. If both springs get compressed, what is happening to M2? Well, this spring here is getting compressed because it is pushing against M2 and making M2 move to the right. So the force must be to the right. And the magnitude of that force is the stiffness constant times the relative displacement of both sides of that spring, which in this case is X3 minus X2, right? X3 minus X2.
Now, if mass M1 moves to the right and compresses the other spring, now notice that that spring is pushing back on mass M2, right? Because it is the, the, the box is moving towards it. So as that spring is compressed, it needs to apply a force in the opposite direction. This is M2. And the magnitude is again the compression, again, the compression of this spring which in this case is X2, one side of the spring, X1, the other side of the spring. Does that help? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Any other questions? No, all good. And from now on, you can just establish the equations of motion by using Newton's law. All good? Okay, well, if there are no further questions, then let's just start with the lecture four. So today the focus is to model electrical systems, find the defining differential equations that describe or govern the behavior of the electrical circuit and uh, understand the impulse and the step responses applied to an electrical circuit. So let's jump right into it. For an electrical circuit, we need three main elements to describe them, the resistor, capacitor, and inductor. We are using a lumped model to describe these resistors, meaning that an entire system that has a resistance is only represented by one element for that resistance, uh, for that part that, that has that a constant resistance. Other elements need to be added to the system to represent other behaviors such as capacitance or inductance. Let's start with the very the first one. The first one is a resistor that is going to be represented by this symbol here. And let's assume that through that resistor, there is a current I. If the current I flows through that resistor, then there is a voltage drop between one side and the other side of that resistor. And the potential on V1 on the left side, of the resistor is greater than that of V2. The voltage drop occurs as the current passes through it. And you can, uh, say that at the magnitude of that voltage drop, delta V equals to V1 minus V2, which is the current times the resistance of the resistor. Now we are assuming here that this resistor is ideal. It has no inductance and no capacitance, which in reality may not always be true, especially at high frequencies, okay? So that's the first element, the basic one. The second one is the capacitor. And for the capacitor, we are assuming that the capacitor is ideal. It has no inductance, no resistance. And the capacitor here is here to store energy in the form of a electrical field. If you make a voltage uh, current to go through it, we can say that the, someone has the uh, microphone open, if you could please. Uh, Mute that wouldn't be great. We can say that when the current goes through the capacitor, there is a voltage drop delta V, which is the same V1 minus V2. And as a function of the current, this is given as one over C integral of I of T dt. I of T dt. Okay. If we rearrange this equation, we could determine an expression for the current by just multiplying both sides of the equation, we have voltage across the capacitor times C equals to integral of I dt. Right, so if you take the derivative now on both sides of this equation, we can say that the current through the capacitor is C di of t over dt. Now these are the same expressions. One is given the current, the other one is given the voltage. So what can we conclude from this equations? Well, we can say that this system, the voltage in the system depends on the history of past current through it. But you can also say that when the, cur the current, uh, sorry, the VDT, excuse me. When the voltage through the capacitor is constant, there is no voltage, there is no current through it. When the voltage across the capacitor is constant, 
there is no current through it because dv dt, the derivative of a constant, is zero. That is to say that in, in a DC circuit, if all voltages are constant, no current flows through the capacitor and that becomes a open circuit. Okay, in DC, the capacitor becomes an open circuit because the value of the voltage here is constant and the derivative of a constant is zero. The last element is the inductor. And the inductor stores energy in the form of a magnetic field. As the current flows through the inductor, and here again, a ideal inductor with no capacitance and no resistance, the voltage drop across the inductor, let's just call that a VL now, which is again, V1 minus V2, is simply, what is the voltage across the inductor? From electrical circuits, on basic electric circuits, is the inductance times the derivative of the current, di of t dt. Okay, so for a voltage to exist across the inductor, there must be a changing a, a changing current. In DC, you know, in DC the voltage is the, the current is constant, and once the current is constant the derivative of that constant is zero. That means there is no voltage drop across the inductor. In other words, in a DC circuit, the inductor becomes a short circuit. There is no voltage drop across it. Right? Why? Because it requires a changing current for a voltage to be, to be developed according to that expression. All right. What is the voltage? What is, what is the expression for the current if you rearrange this equation? Well, we can multiply both sides of the equation by one over L. So that gives one over L VL equals to the derivative of the current. So if we integrate both sides of the equation, VL dt equals to I of t. All right, that's the current through the capacitor that depends on the integral of its voltage. So these are the three elements we need. Just let me just highlight that one more time. If you're dealing with a DC circuit, then the capacitor becomes an open circuit because no current flows through it. And the inductor becomes a short circuit because there is no voltage drop across it. Okay. All good. Quick review of electrical circuits. Any, any questions here? No? All right, let's do an example. So here we have a LRC circuit. And we want to and we have a voltage input V and you want to find the relation between the voltage, the current and the charge in this circuit. So let's start with the voltage, uh, excuse me, voltage and uh, current. As you turn on this circuit, there, are, there is a current been developed in the center here. Let's call that current I of T. And if you now want to link the current and the voltage, we can apply Kirchhoff's law, which states that the sum of all voltages in a closed loop equals to zero. Sum of voltages in a closed loop equals to zero. V is the voltage input and will push electrons in that way, meaning that the voltage differential is lower at the bottom and greater at the top. But as the current now goes through each of these elements, we have an opposite behavior. We have a higher potential before each element than after it passes through that element. But V is, is reversed because V is an external input to the system. We can now apply the uh, we can apply Kirchhoff's law by maybe establishing that if you go from a positive to a negative potential, if the potential decreases as you go through an element, the voltage drop is positive. And if you go through the other way from a negative to a positive, then the voltage drop becomes negative, which means that you can now sum of all, so make the sum of all four, uh, all voltages here, equate that to zero. That's a starting, a started by going through the voltage V, which is simply negative V, because our, our, as per our convention is going negative, positive, it's negative, plus the voltage across the capacitor, which is 
Now positive because you're going from positive to negative. One over C integral of the current itself plus the voltage drop across the resistor R I of T and plus the voltage drop across the inductor L D I of T, excuse me, D I of T dt and this is equal to zero okay so now negative v can go to the other side of the equation you're not going to rewrite it or just move it over there equals to v of t so we see in one one side of the equation the input voltage to the system external to the system which equates to the voltage drop across all other elements in the system itself all right Now that, that relates the voltage input and the, the current, we can see the current showing up in every element here. It's a differential equation. Right now we don't have the tools to solve it. And we'll see that in the next lecture, but that is a differential equation that governs the system that way. Now, if you want to find the relation between the charge of this in the circuit and the voltage, we can link the charge to the current and then replace it in here and manipulate the equation to be a function of the charge. So what is the relation? between charge and current. What is the relation between charge and current? What is, car what, what is the current? Current, uh, is... current is the rate of change of charge. Aha, uh -huh, very good. Current is the rate of change of the charge, which means that we can write I of T as If it is the rate of change of the charge, is simply the derivative of the charge over time, right? Is the flux of electrons, the derivative of the, the, the rate of change of the charge, the derivative of the charge over time. Very well. So if that is the case, we can now take this equation and replace in the other one we constructed here. So now we have one over C integral of I of T dt, but I of T is the derivative of the charge. So the derivative and the integral will cancel out. And you can say that this is equivalent to one over C times the charge. Right? By inputting I of T here, I of T depends on the derivative. But you now take the integral of the derivative, they will cancel out. Plus R times the current, which is dq dt plus L. Now you notice here the derivative of the current and the current is the derivative of the charge. So if you combine these two, we have the second derivative of the current or the charge over time. And this is equal to V of T. If you use the notation we established in the last lecture, we have one over CQ plus RQ uh, dot plus LQ double dot equals to V of T, where the dot represents the first derivative with respect to time. Okay, so here we have both equations. One relates the current, one relates to the voltage, one relates the charge in the circuit to the voltage. Any questions? Any questions? No? As a reminder, I cannot see the chat. So if you have questions, I ask that you uh, use your microphone or maybe type your question if somebody else wants to read that for you, that would be great. Okay. If there are no further questions, I'm going to move on. Yeah? Okay. All right, so here is the second example. Find the relation between the input current and the voltage across the inductor. This is a bit different because now the input to the system is a current. In the last one, we had the input being a voltage. So now you want to find the relation between V across the inductor, let's call this VL and the input current I. So what can we say here? Well, this is 
a bit different. Let's assume that at the voltage through the capacitor here, let's call that IC, the, the current, and the, vo the current through the inductor, let's call that IL. Let's call the voltage through the capacitor VC, and voltage through the inductor is VL. So what kind of uh, relations can we establish here? We can start by saying that uh, there is a, a relation between the, car the input current and the other two currents, which is IFT equals to all currents entering this node equal equates to the current leaving the node. So I of T equals to IC plus IL. What else can we say? What is the relation between the voltage across capacitor and the inductor? Uh, since they're parallel should be the same. Yeah, they are the same exactly because they are in parallel. So VC equals to VL. And what is VC? What is the voltage across the capacitor is yes, one over C integral of the current through it, which is IC dt. And this is the same as VL. Right, so here we have IC in the equation, but we want to relate this to IT, to IT, the input to uh, I of T, the input to the system. So we could replace IC with the first equation here. The first equation can be rewritten as IC equals to I of T minus IL. And now if we input that into this equation, one over C integral of IC, which is I of T minus IL dt. And this is our VC, which is the same as V of T, uh, V of L, right? The voltage across the inductor, VL. Now, our uh, job here, our objective is to find a relation between the input current and the voltage across the inductor. We have now in this equation, three elements, well, the two that we want, the voltage across the inductor and the input current, but we also have the, the current through the inductor and we don't want that. How can we relate now the current through the inductor to the voltage across the inductor? Well, we know that the voltage across the inductor is also L DIL DT, which is the same as one over L VL equals to DIL DT. We can now take the integral of both sides of this equation and have one over L integral of VL DT equals to IL. And that's the relation that it was missing. We can simply replace this into here and write the final relation we were looking for. VL equals to one over C integral of I of T minus I L, which is given by that expression, one over L integral again of V L D T. And that's the final relation. Now notice that in this expression here, we only have the input of current and the voltage across the inductor as we wanted. So this is a relatively straightforward problem because we can get to a point where it's easy to replace all the variables and create a differential equation. But how do we solve this now? Well, we still don't have the tools to do that because this is a differential, second order differential equation. We'll see that in the next lecture, okay? And because each equation that we are writing most of the time is by itself a differential equation, it might be hard sometimes to combine all of them. So in the next lecture, we'll see how to eliminate derivatives and the integration using the Laplace transform. We're going to create new expressions that are all functions of the same variable. That will allow us to manipulate these expressions uh, a lot easier um, and combine them to find the final uh, explicit relation between two quantities in the system. Any questions here?
No? All good? All right. There are no questions. I'm going to move on. Yeah. All right. Now, now that we have uh, the, this, this, the, the modeling parts done, we can think about the input signals. And let's go back to for the third time to these common input signals, but let's see what they represent in the, in the case of this electrical circuit. We have the impulse function, and a large amount of energy provided to the system at a very small amount of time. The e step function, the step function, a, uh, an action provided to the system and then held constant. A ramp function where that action goes up over time and the parabolic function that it goes up on time, but exponentially. Each of these could be a current or could be a voltage applied to, uh, to the system. In the case of an impulse for an electrical circuit, that corresponds if the, impulse, uh, the, the input is a voltage to a very large voltage applied to the system at a small amount of time that it will create some initial conditions, we will start the system, and then we remove that excitation and we let the system settle back uh, where it started, provided that it does that. The step input would be, for example, a voltage applied to one of these systems and then held constant or flipping a switch. We apply a voltage and you let the voltage constant over time and we watch how the system settles at a given current or voltage somewhere else. A ramp input would be, in this case, a voltage that increases linearly over time. At time one, the voltage is one, sec one volt, time two is two volts, three is three volts, and so on. Right? And that slope can be changed, of course. And the final one is the ramp input, where the voltage now increases over time, but is not, uh, the, that relation is not linear. Let's see what that does effectively to the system. Let's take the example we, we modeled in the, first, in the first example here, give some random values for L, R, and C. They are given there. And let's see how the charge responds to a input uh, step and an, impul and an impulse response so in an impulse. So here we have the step in response and here we have the impulse. So the step response means that the input is a step voltage. Now we apply the given voltage to the system and we held that a voltage constant. So what is happening? So this, this is V of T and this is time. What, happening, what is happening to the charge here? We see that originally there are some fluctuations. What is happening there? Well, that's the energy being transferred between the inductor and the capacitor back and forth, some oscillations there. And eventually, because they are going through the resistor, the resistor will dissipate some energy and kind of damp out those oscillations and eventually settles at a constant value. And this constant value here is not zero because the voltage is, is maintained to maintain that a level of charge in the circuit, to maintain the level of charge in the circuit. Now, if you remove the voltage that is pushing the electrons there, the charge in there, then uh, the, volt, the, the, the energy will go again be to, uh, through the capacitor and the inductor back and forth. But in that process, it passes through the resistor and the resistor dissipates energy to the point where there is no energy left in the system. And then the, the charge would be zero. A quick question. Yeah. So in this case, the, so we have a voltage that's held constant, and then that leads to a current that fluctuates before it stabilizes in the two bottom graphs, right? Yes, we are looking at the charge here. The current would be a bit different. It would also fluctuate. We'll see the current later. Let's focus on the charge. Okay. For now, yeah, it fluctuates a bit. And the reason for that fluctuation is the energy exchange from the electrical field in the capacitor to the magnetic field in the inductor. The energy goes back and forth. So. That's where the oscillation comes from. The oscillation eventually disappears because in the process of transferring the energy between these two elements, there is the resistor and the resistor dissipates energy in the form of heat. That's joules losses. Right? So that's why the oscillations get smaller and smaller over time. We'll model this later and we have a better understanding of this um, in one of 
our upcoming lectures. But that's what happens to the chart. What I wanted to retain here, besides the fact that there's some oscillations, is the fact that the current does not settle at zero. It settles at a constant value because the voltage is applied and held constant to maintain the level of charge in the circuit. Okay. Any other questions? No? All right, so let's, let, let's look at the impulse response. The impulse response, what we did is that we gave the system an excitation, a very large excitation at time zero. And then you let the system go from there. So when you did that, look what happens to the charge. The charge started to go up, but it is following pretty much the same behavior as the step response, but then the excitation is removed. And as the excitation is removed, there is nothing there enforcing or pushing the charge in the circuit anymore. And eventually it settles at a at zero. Right? We develop a charge, but then you remove the excitation, the charge goes to zero. Now let's uh, look at the current and see what the current does. First, using a step input. So same as before, a voltage is applied and held a constant. Now look what happens to the, the, the current, which is the derivative of the charge. So if you take the derivative of this graph, we, should, we get that graph, which makes sense. And notice here that in, as time tends to infinity, the, the current, the charge tends to a constant value. And the derivative of that is of course zero. So unlike the charge, the current settles at zero once the, the excitations, the, the um, oscillations subside. Why does that change settle at zero? Why does that? Would it be zero? because the capacitor wants to hold the current at the same level? That would and be so the inductor. And the inductor will pose changes in the current. Your uh, inductor in the opposes changes to the current, but it is, it is because of the capacitor, not, um, but because of the, because the capacitor in DC becomes an open circuit. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. let's write the equation here. VC equals to one over C integral of I DT, which means that I of T equals to C DV DT. In DC, once everything settles, this is zero. No current can flow through the capacitor. No current flows anywhere in the circuit. We can confirm that by looking at the charge response and the charge settles eventually at a constant value. If you take the derivative of that constant value, we must get zero and that's precisely what we see there. Right? And the impulse response follows the same behavior once we apply the charge, the, the voltage and remove the voltage of a current as initially established, the current then creates energy in the capacitor or and the inductor. That energy is transferred between them back and forth. That's where the oscillations come from. But because there is nothing else pushing uh, a current in the system, then eventually it dies off to zero. Okay, so here is the impulse. Here is the step response. Any questions here? No. Sure. Okay. You will see later that uh, this step and uh, impulse responses will correspond to the exact same type of responses we would see in a mechanical system. The um, the position response to a uh, to a force input in a mechanical system is exactly the same as the step response uh, of the charge to a, uh, a step input. So charge is equivalent to displacement and the speed in the mass damper system will be equivalent to the current here. We'll see that they follow exactly the same behavior. So well, that's subject of another lecture. No questions, all good. So 
you're very quiet today is it because this is trivial or because you don't know what to ask. All good? Let me know in the chat how, um, if you don't want to ask questions. So I, I give me some feedback there in the chat if you find this easy or hard uh, so I can tune the, the lecture accordingly, All right? You can send me a private message if you don't want to share your opinion with the others. All right, so that's that. Uh, it's really simple. Let's do one exercise here. Let's just start, start with exercise one. And in this exercise, we have an electrical circuit. It has two branches. And uh, we are looking at the differential equations that are govern this circuit. Let's do that then. So here is the circuit. We have a voltage input. We have two currents. One current is defined here. One, the other one goes around that other loop. And you want the equations that describe this system. So you have two loops. We can address each of them separately at a given time and write two equations by following these two closed loops. We know that for Kirchhoff's, from Kirchhoff's law, the sum of all voltages in any closed loop equals to zero. So you can take this closed loop and this one and write two equations there. Let's just start with that one. So we have the sum of all voltages there equals to zero. We know that when you have an external voltage input, the sum of the voltage drop will be the same as that, as the example we did before, or negative V plus this voltage drop plus that voltage drop equals to zero. So move V to the other side. We know that V of T, the input is what? So now let's, default, let's follow the closed loop here along the direction of the current I1 that flows in that loop. The first voltage drop we see is the voltage drop across that resistor that is I1 of T times R. And now we are going down here through this inductor. And what is the voltage drop there? What is the voltage drop there? Any ideas? Um, L times di of t by dt. Di dt, exactly, the derivative of the current, right? But now which current are we talking about? Because if you look at the inductor here, we have defined I going this way, but we also have defined I going that way. So through the inductor, we actually have two currents. We have I1 going downwards, but we have I2 going upwards. So this will now depend on the net current through the inductor which is the difference between them, them, I1 minus I2. Why not I2 minus I1? Well, because we are following this reference. This is our reference. This is the sense of positive currents. Right? This creates a positive and negative potential here. So the potential decreases as you go through the inductor. So that's our positive reference. Now this current is going in the opposite direction. So that becomes negative. Right? And this is the net current through that inductor. Okay. Now let's do the second loop here. The second loop, we can start at the inductor, the, the resistor, and we are now following this current in this loop here, the current I2. So the voltage, uh, Kirchhoff's law will state that the voltage drop here plus that plus that equals to zero. So the first one is the resistor that is R times I2 of T plus the voltage drop across the capacitor, which is one over C integral of the current through the capacitor, which is I2 
dt. Of course, this is I2 of t. I2 of t is just if sometimes I forget to have that. And it's less things to erase later. So that's the voltage drop across the capacitor. And now we are going up through the inductor. And the voltage drop across the inductor is L times the derivative of the net current. So what goes in there? Would it be I2 minus I1? Exactly. It is I2 minus I1. All right. And this actually show up exactly the same color. I2 minus I1. Why? Because now we are following I2. That's the positive reference. I2 goes up here. I1 is going against it. So if I2 is our positive reference that allowed us to write this equation, then I1 needs to be negative. And this equals to zero. And these are the two equations. Now, if we want, for example, the relation between the voltage input and the current in the second loop, we have to isolate the current I1, replace the current I1 there, and then find an expression that links V and I2 directly. So this is going to be quite messy because these are two differential equations. We need a better way to do this. And this better way is called the Laplace transform which will convert the integrations and the derivatives to a common variable. And that will allow us to manipulate these equations a lot easier. And that is the, uh, what you're going to see in the next lecture and the lecture after that. Any questions here? I just have uh, one, just want to clarify. So yeah. in the inductor, like let's say it's going around the loop, let's say the top of the inductor is positive and the bottom is negative. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't, and the second equation wouldn't be minus L D over DT, or would it still be positive? Right, yeah, so good question. So that depends on how we look at the system. If our reference is a, uh, this current, this current is creating a voltage drop that is greater at the top and smaller at the bottom, right? But this current is doing the opposite because the cur this current is going that way. So this current would be creating a, a voltage drop that is more like that. Oh, okay, all right. all right. So we need to always look at the voltage drop based on the current we are following. Okay. So this justifies then the fact that if you look at this voltage drop from this current, it is going in the, in, in the right sense, but then this current is going in the opposite. It's creating the voltage drop in the opposite direction, hence the negative sign just for that current. Would it be okay if like, I, like if I do a problem like this, I, I just make it, like minus L for the second second loop minus L. No. DT, no, no, doesn't work. It doesn't work because you would if you put a minus L here, then what goes inside there? I one oh, okay. plus I two. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't work, right? Because these currents are going in the opposite direction. Okay. Right? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. So maybe let's do this. Let's write this equation differently. Let's take this equation here. When you could have written. It's, it's exactly the same equation, but it's the voltage drop created by this current, which is L di1 dt. It's positive because this voltage, this current goes positive negative, minus L di2 dt, because that is the voltage drop caused by the other current, which in this case, as it goes through here, is going from negative to positive. Right? which is the same as uh, just factoring out derivative I1 minus I2. That's the same equation. It's just another way to see what is going on. Okay. All right, but there is no other way to write it. It needs to be positive. Any other questions? Any other questions, folks? No? All right. There are no other questions. Let's do exercise three here.
in exercise three, we want the differential equations that will relate the input voltage to the output voltage. And in this case, the output voltage is defined as the voltage across the inductor. So take a look at this. I'm gonna raise the board in the meantime. And then let's solve. This is also very simple. So what we're gonna do here, we can start with the voltage. Uh, Kirchhoff's law using the uh, voltage, the sum of voltages in the data loop that you can create in the center. We'll do that and then you can compare our answers. It's a bit hard to clean the slide board. is should be figure two yeah it just needs some time to dry before i can erase it otherwise it just spread the mess it is. all right so this is the circuit here is the input a resistor capacitor in the resistor and this is the voltage output now notice that the voltage output uh, i think i meant i said the voltage across the capacitor earlier, but in fact, the voltage output is defined as the voltage drop across these two elements together, not only the voltage across the capacitor. Very well, but that is no problem for us. We can define a current here inside this loop. It's called this current I of T. And you can use Kirchhoff's law to do or calculate, to calculate now the sum of all voltages and equate that to zero or sum of voltage across every element equals to the input voltage. So tell me what the equation is. V of T is R times I of T. I times uh, R times I, yeah, that. Sorry, yeah, I of T times R, sorry. Right. Um, and then it would be plus uh, one over C, uh, D I over DT. Right, so that is the voltage across the inductor. The inductor, remember that the inductor opposes changes in the current, right? So it doesn't want to see changes in the current. So the greater the change, the greater the voltage developed by it. The capacitor, we can assume, look at the capacitor as being a tank that accumulates charge. So if it accumulates charge, it depends on the integral. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. No problem there. And then again, I times R. I times R. Very good. All right. So two R I plus the integral of the current. Our voltage output is defined here, is V out. What is the expression for V out? Oh, well, it's simply the voltage across the capacitor plus that of the induct uh, of the resistor. So it's simply IR plus over one over C integral of I of T dt. That's all. all right, that accounts for these two elements here. Very good. Easy, easy. Any questions? No? All right. See, there's nothing to be afraid of when it comes to electrical circuits. Unless we are talking about Northam theorem and all that stuff, that can get a bit more complicated for sure. No questions here?
If there are no questions, let's do this one. Here we have, we're going to reuse this circuit in another exercise later on. So I thought it would be nice to introduce it here. So here's a bit more complicated. We just want the equations governing this circuit. So let's, what we're gonna do here is just write as many equations as we can, even if they are redundant. Let's see what we can derive for this circuit. We don't have a specific objective here. We don't want to relate anything in particular. Let's just see what kind of relations we can establish based on this. Later, once you have the tools to solve the differential equations, then I'm going to explicitly ask you to find, for example, an equation that gives the relation between the voltage across the inductor and the input current, for example, which is perfectly doable once we have the right tools. But for now, let's assume that that's not really, we don't have a specific objective, we just want to write the equation. the generic equations, I should say. All right, so that's our lovely circuit there. We have two inductors, capacitor and a resistor. Here we have an input current to the system. Well, if we have an input current, we can find all currents going through each element. Let me call this current through inductor L2, I2. The current through the capacitor here, let me call that IC. And the current through this inductor, let me call that I1. Let's just start maybe by relating all these currents. Can we write a re the relation between them? What, what is the relation between them? We can use a nodal equation somewhere. And you know that all currents going in that node equate to the amount of currents coming out of that node. And that node could be this point up here, which is the same as this one, eh? This point, we could just move it there, right? Just, oops, I accidentally destroyed my writing here. Right? This point is the same as that point, they're connected. So what can you say here? We can say that the sum of all currents entering the node, which is the input current equals to I1 plus I2 plus IC. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so what if else? we pick, and if we pick the other node, uh, one of them would just be negative, correct? The I two. Yeah. If you pick, uh, but that is really the only node we have because this node is pretty much the same as that one. It, I could have connected the capacitor over there directly, right? Well, I, I can call, for example, a car, I can create another current here, which is I C plus I one. Nice, the current going through here is IC plus I1. Mm, equals those two, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right, what else can we, see? what is the relation between the voltage across this inductor and this capacitor? We can see that VL2 equals to VC, the voltage across here. And there is precisely the same because they are in parallel. Which in other words is what is VL2? What is this voltage? Is L2 times integral or derivative of the current? Derivative. Derivative, very good, di2 dt. Remember that the inductor opposes changes in the current. It doesn't want to see changes in the current. It wants to maintain the same magnetic field inside. It wants to maintain that constant. So if the current changes, it creates 
a voltage differential to compensate for that. So the greater the change in current, the greater the voltage, the greater the inductance, the greater uh, the change in, volt in current, the greater the current, the voltage, and the greater the inductance, the greater the voltage as well. Now the capacitor has, is a tank that accumulates charge and electrons. So the, the voltage there will depend on the past values of all electrons and all charge that is going in that tank. This analogy doesn't make much physical sense, but that's a good way to see it. So that will now depend, it depends on the past history. It depends on the integration, the accumulation of all currents, all charges. Or the amount of charge, right? Depends on them, let's put it this way, depends on the amount of charge, because this is the, the rate of change of the charge. If you want to find the total charge, just integrate. Okay, what else can we write? Well, we can take this closed loop here and write an expression there. What would that look like? We know that the sum of all voltages in this closed loop is equal to zero. So we could say that uh, V, uh, the voltage across the inductor here, which is called V of T, which is the same as I1, uh, excuse me, L I1, L times D I1 DT, which is the same as VT, plus the voltage across the capacitor, which is one over C integral of I1. Because if you wrote this expression, then these two currents will have to come through the bottom line and then go up, right? They'll have to come here. This current goes here and goes up. So this is different than a current that loops in here. If that is the case, if this current is not looping here, but is actually going down and then up, then the only voltage through this capacitor is indeed IC. Is indeed IC. All right, so this is just IC dt, and this is just IC dt, not even I1. It's just the voltage across the capacitor. 